Welcome to the SEI podcast series, a production of Carnegie Mellon University's Software Engineering Institute. The SEI is a federally funded research and development center operated by Carnegie Mellon University and sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. A copy of today's podcast is available on the SEI website at www.sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts. My name is Suzanne Miller. I'm a principal researcher here at the SEI, and today I'm very pleased to introduce my colleague, Vijay Sarvapelli, who will be speaking us today about DNS, domain name server blocking, as a strategy for combating cybersecurity threats. So I want to welcome Vijay. And before we get started into the topic itself, want to, our, our viewers will want to know a little bit about who are you and what brought you to the SEI to do this kind of work? What is it that makes this work important to you? Uh, I'm, yeah, as you introduced, I, I work at the SCI at the CERT division, which is actually the cybersecurity division. I come from a background of electrical and computer engineering, about 25 plus years of working okay. at different electrical and computer problems. And uh, our division is focused on basically building response to cybersecurity threats. Yes. Both uh, with technology, process, and with uh, training and different tools we provide, you know. And my specific role is to really help very large enterprises like the government and the DOD deal with cybersecurity okay. and build security solutions for it. So you're looking at from an enterprise systems viewpoint? Yes, absolutely. Uh, very large scale systems, very high impact, really targeting to support somebody like CISO and vice president of security. To so a CISO is a... Uh, Chief Information Security Officer. Information Security Officer. I keep yeah. saying CSO, but I'm seeing CISO more often now. Yeah. So C I S O is stands for Chief Information Security okay. Officer. All right. Um, so it, it's really to help people like that build security solutions and an architecture to deliver security solutions. So how do we help them to visualize these kinds of solutions? I've seen in your blog po post that you use metaphors. Yeah. Um, and you, you've got some sort of conceptions. Why don't you tell us about some of the things you're using to help these level, executive levels uh, officers understand what it is they're up against and what kinds of solutions might be useful to them? Yeah, so the uh, thing I proposed was really to come up with something called a cybersecurity portfolio, which helps describe all the cybersecurity capabilities they have. It's kind of a counter framework to what... Uh, Lockheed Martin released as a cyber kill chain to basically deliver capabilities to combat these threats. Okay. You know, there's different types of threats, different stages at which these threats come in. The nice thing that Lockheed did was to introduce cyber kill chain to show there's actually a chain of events that actually takes place for a particular compromise to happen. So the case I'm making is if you can break the chain, you broke the chain, basically you're making it... Uh, not feasible for them to complete, and I'm providing a number of different capabilities that help you break this chain. So what is it that made you choose domain name systems, DNS, as the actual target for building countermeasures uh, to s disrupt the cyber kill chain? Um, domain name system is uh, it's an, kind of an esoteric protocol. A lot of people don't understand it. But uh, just like in the blog post, I represent the radius of attack that we try to increase in the IED. Domain name system is a very powerful one that covers a huge number of portions of this kill chain okay. that we can actually uh, disrupt communication, making basically malware ineffective in either doing stealing data or denying service, whatever their objective is. It gives us a very powerful tool to cover a very large range of uh, capabilities that they bring in throughout the kill chain. That's why I chose DNS, and DNS uh, is a lot like electronic jamming. If you can actually kill DNS, you actually make it impossible for a communication to even initiate, okay. which is a very good starting point to be in. I want to warn you, electronic jamming is uh, <laughs> uh, something that people have taken too much to an extreme. Here, there's some limitations on what we do with DNS. It's not exactly like the physical world. It's, it's right. more logical. You know? So when, when I hear that we're going to sort of have this large radius of effect, then I put my user hat on. And, and, I, and so I, I think about what are the effects on users when you're trying to use DNS denial as one of the ways of 
of uh, countermeasures and attacks? Are there implications for the user community that um, you know you you aren't going to be able to access valid um, sites that happen to have a, a DNS that is um, potentially mm -hmm. malicious? Like Easter, yeah. um, you know, we run into some of that. I think in in our everyday work right now. Um, you know, yeah. and so. How do how do how do you mitigate against that kind of effect? Yeah, de definitely. This is uh, this is some of the things that uh, CISO level people or vice president of security right. struggle with because they see the user impact and they feel paralyzed, not to be able to do something. I walked through in the blog post some options you have as to how you can steer the user community. And if you don't have a user community and you're a critical infrastructure location, then you have lesser problems. Right. But if you do have both in the same network, you can actually choose how you redirect the traffic ah. and how do you basically represent something to the user to be able to call the service desk and uh, go through procedures to isolate and see if this is actually not malicious, how do right. we overcome those limits, you know? So the, the idea of creating a whitelist Yes. Um, even though it has some properties that might make it seem like it's malicious, if it's on the whitelist, then it's something that I'll be able to access and use in my work. Yeah, so the DNS blocking uh, today has come a very long way. It's very mature. So you could do whitelist before blacklist, and there's concepts like gray list you can do where you basically delay the response, which makes it very difficult for malware to respond, but a human being can respond to it. Uh -huh. Much like CAPTCHA or ReCAPTCHA, where a person actually makes a request and he can get through, but a malicious code does not know that this actually requires something to be done. Right, right. Okay, so, so there are some ways of making sure that the user community can still do their work, so that's good, because that's, that's a big conflict a lot of times, is we get so we have very strong security needs, but users have needs for doing work. So sometimes right. those are in conflict. But what are some of the other enterprise level, since we're speaking sort of about the CISO level, what are some of the other enterprise level things that someone thinking about doing this kind of blocking needs to take into account if they wanted to use uh, DNS uh, blocking as one of their strategies? Right. So uh, the, there's a number of different... Uh, new techniques that uh, people have done research on that I write up on the blog post. One of them, for example, is newly observed domains. The likelihood of newly observed domains, meaning a domain that's never been used by anybody to access, unlike google.com, mm -hmm. which everybody accesses every day, it's likely that's going to be malicious. So you could actually put this in this gray list type of, types of scenario, then you get a very big effect of being able to say, these domains are very likely to be bad. Right and something like 99% of them are bad. And there are service providers who are willing to sell you this type of newly registered domains, which makes it very effective for you yeah. to subscribe to a list and be able to find out if this is actually being used for malicious purpose and block it. Okay. So there's a number of different uh, things I highlight there. The um, trick is like I show in the cybersecurity portfolio, from left to right, I try to go through different capabilities, DNS falls right in the middle. And within that, we have all these options about picking some very highly effective uh, capabilities okay. to block broadly what malicious code does. You know. Excellent. So this is one of those strategies that really is implementable, not just a research uh, idea. So, and it's, and do you have any examples of um, things that have been caught this way or have been thwarted, I guess, um, by using this strategy that you would be able to share? Yeah, sure. Uh, just recently, VeriSign and um, Infoblox and Farsight are three big providers who concentrate on this. They actually analyzed the WannaCry ransomware ah. and found out different parts of the ransomware where they can actually kill it by DNS blocking. And it's very simple, very simple to uh, implement, and the impact is very big because WannaCry is not able to encrypt the files before it starts its process of asking for ransom money. Ah. Similarly, in DDoS world, the Mirai botnet, for example, depends heavily on DNS as well to get its different parts of its uh, malicious code okay. back to a source. So that is also, uh, it's, of course, after the fact, but if you had this capability in production in many um, industry critical sites, WannaCry, for example, would be very ineffective. Well, 
anything that will make ransomware ineffective is, <laughs> is a plus yes, in, is. in most people's books. So we talked about the enterprise level, but I mean, when we talk about ransomware, often that is targeted at individuals. Are there things that individuals can do to, uh, are there utilities and things that they can use to enact a DNS server, a DNS uh, denial on, on their own? Could I do that on my home network? Yes, there's there's many new providers which are really sprung up. Some of them even provide free service for something like this. Open DNS is an example, which is uh, bought over by Cisco and it's called Cisco Umbrella Service now. Okay. Which basically gives you a DNS whitelisted number of domains that all people access. It's the likelihood sure. of you having bad stuff come back to you is very very small, and you can use the blacklist to block even large categories. Say you want to block pornography, right. or you want to block file sharing protocols, you could pick those things as big buckets, big categories under which okay. at the very initiation of communication, you can actually kill those type of communication, either by policy or because of the risk they introduced to you personally or to the enterprise. I, I think that that makes this even more powerful yeah. because it's both an enterprise level technology and a, uh, a, a strategy yeah. and also an individual strategy. We don't often see ones that kind of go through that whole gamut. So this is something that uh, sounds very promising. And uh, anybody that's, that's uh, been affected by some of these attacks, I think will will find this very useful to look at your blog post right. and take some action. That's the, that's the thing. Don't just read about it. These are all things that we need to all take action on if we're going to actually uh, prevent these kinds of threats from occurring in the future. So what are some of the areas that you're working on now that are either taking this research further or new areas of research that uh, we may see future writings from you on, VJ? Yeah, uh, just focusing on DNS, we actually have done the other side. We uh, recommend whenever we talk to the CISOs, um, much like Robert Foster's code on uh, putting up a fence and then finding out why it was there, and you don't know why it was there. So we really recommend monitoring of this fence. Mm -hmm. You put a DNS firewall, it's like a fence in one way. How do you actually monitor it and how do you mature it? So the second series of blog posts we're looking at is basically analyzing what we call passive DNS. We can find out what is escaping this fence, possibly, and what are the techniques the adversaries are using now that they know you're using DNS blocking. Right. What are they using to try to get around it? You know? yeah, th this is a, a cycle. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, we did some analysis of uh, DNS being used for covert channels, being able to exfil information out. You know, So that's something we're going to write uh -huh. on soon. And then there's another side of if you do now passive DNS and uh, active blocking, now we have a full loop control system. If you look at it from the okay. electrical side, you can actually measure what is escaping and keep feeding it to reduce the amount of risk you're keeping, uh, introducing regularly to the enterprise. You know? So that, those are the ideas we have for the next few blog, uh, next few blog posts. Excellent. So I look forward to those. Um, I did not expect that this would be something that would be applicable personally. Now I'm going to have to go find out about the tools that I can use because I've not been a victim of ransomware net yet, and I don't want to be. <laughs> so um, I'm all in for that. I want to thank you for joining us today, VJ, and I want to point our viewers to our your blog post, which all of our blog posts are found at insights.sei.cmu.edu. And I think if you just search on VJ, V-I-J-A-Y, you won't get too many other VJs out there <laughs> that are writing. You could also go to Sarvapelli, S-A-R-V-E-P-A-L-L-I, and that's probably will guarantee to get only this VJ. Yeah. So um, I do thank you for joining us, and I, I do want to remind our viewers that you can find this podcast on the SEI website at www.sei.cmu.com edu slash podcast, excuse me, and on our YouTube channel, we do have one, and you can also find it on the Carnegie Mellon iTunes U site. So as always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask at info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you for watching. <laughs>